Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Uh, we've got another special one today. We are talking to a family member of a missing person, and we want to get as much good detail out there as we can. This is a case that was previously covered on the Vanished podcast. Uh, Marissa did her usual excellent job on that. It was actually just about a year ago uh, that that was covered there. We've got a little more detail we're going to get into today's case, which is the case of missing person Daniel Kenneth Oberg, also known as Danny. Danny went missing from Sweet Home, Oregon. Uh, he's been missing since April 23rd, 2017. He was 28 years old at the time of his disappearance. Uh, he's now 29, six feet tall, about 160 pounds with brown medium length hair and hazel eyes. He typically has a short beard, uh, almost a bit like mine, a little bit of kind of a chin strap, but sometimes he grows it out even a little bit longer. Uh, he was last seen wearing a black shirt with a skull. Uh, I've seen some people say that it's actually almost like an alien skull. Uh, and I've seen two different descriptions about his pants. One of them is insulated light green pants. And another description I've seen is dark khaki pants. Of course, we'll talk to his father and see if we can get some better detail about that. But um, there is, thankfully, a NamUs record already created, and this is what the description says. Danny went out with one or two friends over the weekend of April 22nd, 2017, and never returned home. The last confirmed sighting was April 23rd, 2017, at 1243 at a local Safeway. Authorities found Danny's car abandoned in the Marcola area and searched nearby, but have not located him. Danny is known to camp in the Quartzville Recreation Corridor in Lynn County. Danny originally had left with his two dogs, both of which have been located. So with all that being said, uh, let me welcome his father, Ken, to the show. Ken, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and of course, uh, know that our heart goes out to you. There are many people that um, want to see a good outcome to this story. And of course, we know that you must be seriously concerned. We're now well over a year that Danny has been missing. And um, I'm just really sorry that your family's having to face this and deal with all this. I know this stuff isn't easy. Yeah, it's been one year and four months. Yeah. Um, so a couple things to clear up. First of all, the description on his pants. Do we know what pants he was wearing that day? Uh, it, it was a like a light green, uh, double insulated, uh, with the, the pockets down lower and everything. I got a pair just like it, and uh, we bought those at Cabela's. Okay. So they're made by Cabela's. Gotcha. Okay. That's a much better description. Thanks for clearing that up. I was also curious. I didn't run into any information about Danny having any piercings or tattoos. No, he doesn't. No piercings or tattoos. Uh, any no. scars or anything from surgeries that he might have had? Uh, he's never had no surgeries. He's wrecked on his longboard a lot. Yeah. And got little uh, scratches on his palm of his hands and on his back and stuff like that. But I don't think any of them were were permanent. Okay. Nothing identifiable in terms of, of scarring or marks like that? No. Okay. Uh, longboarding. So he surfed? No, he just likes to ride a long skateboard. Oh, a skateboard. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It's a, it's a, they call it a longboard because it's longer than a regular one. Right. Uh, he, he used to have a motorized one that you could uh, be, be able to stand on and just tilt it a certain way and it, it makes it go. Oh, yeah. And he had one of those for a long time yeah. until the until the officers in Sweet Home didn't like him racing them around the roads. They told him it was illegal for him to, to have it. So oh. he ended up selling it. Oh, wow. Did he run into any issues with officers outside of that in Sweet Home? Uh, they were always picking on him about having that uh, longboard with a motor on it. He had a uh, little pocket bike, mm -hmm. like a mini it's bigger than a mini bike, but it's a, a 49cc motor, and he was riding that around. Well, some of these officers, they didn't like that he was riding that. One officer gave him a ticket that 
showed on the ticket, he was he got cited for riding an off-road motorcycle, enduro motorcycle, on the public road. When we went into court on it, he tried to explain to him it was a pocket bike. We even had a description from the DNV, but the judge refused to look at it. He sat there and said, well, we're going to have a trial on this. Uh, so instead of paying the $240, it brought it up to over $1,300. Oh, wow. For a trial, and they found him guilty on it. Yeah. Even with, even with all the witnesses and proof that we had, the the justice system in that town is really bad. It kind of a small town type situation? Yeah, it is. Yeah, gotcha. There's a little, there's a little over 8,000 people that live in Sweet Home. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I've heard that story one or, once or twice before when it comes to missing persons and uh, law enforcement in, in small towns. Sometimes there's some... Pretty interesting things that, that happen uh, in those areas. Uh, also, in case anyone noticed, uh, yes, Ken is with some other family, so you might hear some kids occasionally in the background. Uh, and I just wanted to give a big thank you to uh, Chris for helping out with all the technical stuff and getting us uh, rolling on this today as well. Uh, how many siblings does Danny have? He has his younger brother, Chris, and an older sister. Her name's Jennifer. Okay. She lives in Liberty, Missouri. Okay. Uh, and you are no longer uh, married to Danny's mother, right? No, we've been divorced since 96. I've been a single parent since then. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's been rough. I mean, it's even rougher now not knowing where he's at. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure she's very concerned as well. Do you talk to her often about this? Yeah, I've she brings it up every once in a while, but she... Uh, she said that she has has spoken to him through God, through her dreams and all that, and that she wants to have a memorial, and nobody else wants to. They want to find out what happened. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, as long as it eases her mind a little bit, it's okay for her to think the way she's thinking. But I want to find out what happened and have have justice done. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I know a lot of people deal with these types of issues in different ways. And I, I do understand that uh, some people sometimes just want to kind of push through it and just assume that the worst might have happened. And it sounds like she might be in that type of situation. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just a memorial. It could be a vigil. It could be a gathering of people to just get your spirits together and to talk about him and to share time with each other and good memories with each other, and maybe even get some hope reinvigorated for some type of change in this case. Because I know uh, you've been sitting with this, all these unanswered questions for a long time now. Sometimes it could it can help just to get people together for something like that. Um, can you tell us a bit more about Danny, some more about his hobbies and interests as he was growing well, up? He, he's always liked to do video games. Mm -hmm. He liked to play video games. Uh, he's really good at math, like I am. He had a little bit of problems in, in high school with, uh, with history and science, I think it was. Yeah. But uh, other than that, he, I mean, you could bring him a computer and he'll find out exactly what's wrong with it, order parts, if you want a computer built from the ground up, he could do it. Yeah. Any way you want it. If you want it for all kinds of games or if you just want it for just normal household use, he could do whatever you want. When they started making these newer uh, s s s smartphones, uh -huh. if, people can't, if people say, well, I got to get rid of this phone because the piece of glass broke, they bring it over to Danny and sit there and say, hey, can you fix this for me? He would order the piece of glass from overseas and replace the piece of glass and save people a lot of money. And uh, lots of times he, was, he wouldn't even charge them anything for doing it. I mean, just, just for the whatever it cost for shipping and handling and, and the parts that he, we had to buy. Wow. wow. And uh, I, I helped him get into a little bit of, since he couldn't find, he was working at a, uh, at a, company where they were doing the Oregon freezer dry food mm -hmm. and that when he when they laid him off from that he uh, wanted to do something to make some money so 
we were ordering some really fancy shoes from overseas, but you got to buy them in big quantities to get the lower price. So I helped him out on that, do the front money mm-hmm. and my credit card. And then he, we get the shoes for like $20, $25 and they're worth a hundred and hundred fifty dollars here in the United States. Yeah. And he would, he would sell them and this and that. I mean, okay. he was always doing, doing good favors for other people. And I mean, anytime anybody came over, if they were hungry, yeah, he offered them food. He offered them a, a place to to stay. We want to play video games with them all night. Yeah, uh, he was more of a night owl. Except uh, when I needed him to, to help me a little, do a little bit of handyman work during the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds like a really really nice person. I'm really sad to hear that that he's missing right now. Um, so he was living with you. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, we know that he was doing kind of odd stuff, odd work here and there for just making money. He didn't have a day-to-day job at the time he went missing? No, he didn't. Okay. Um, did he have a significant other? Uh, he had this one girlfriend, but they weren't working out, so he broke up with her. Okay. And uh, no, he he had a lot of, lot of girlfriends friends that he would play video games online with and he would have other girls come over there just for friends but no no actual girlfriend okay okay how long before uh before his disappearance did he break up with his serious girlfriend uh i'd say about a year and a half okay okay so it's not like it was something recent and maybe he was depressed about it and wanted to get away or or anything like that this is this is pretty pretty old stuff. A year and a half is a bit of time for, to, for getting over yeah. something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, the, the, the other, the, uh, they were still friends and all that. She even had gone with me on several occasions to help look for him. Oh, wow. Even though, even though her boy, her boyfriend didn't really approve of it too much, but she classifies me as her other dad. And every time that she has a problem, she calls me when I need a little bit of help or, I mean, if I only, out of all the searches that I've gone out, she'd probably only miss one or two. Wow. wow. And, and I've gone out lots of times. I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've put gas in other people's cars to go with me and search and then buy them lunch and all that. Uh, one time we had a real big search going on and the, uh, the the place across Key Bank Subway, he used to go there a lot and get get sandwiches. Uh-huh. When the manager when the manager knew we were having a big search, she made up and paid out of her own pocket a whole bunch of sandwiches and chips and everything we could take to a, another location down by Marcola. Mm-hmm and had food for everybody that showed up. I, I thought that was really neat that, that's, that the lady from Subway actually did that for us. Yeah, absolutely. That's something I always appreciate about uh, looking into these types of cases is hearing about humanity and good people helping other good people. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that, that people are able to do things like that to help people in need. Um, so Please tell us about the last time you saw him. Well, it was on a Sunday morning. Uh, I got up early because I was getting some text messages asking if I could help disassemble some kitchen cabinets for a friend of mine to reuse them. And I was having coffee. And next thing I know, about 7.15, 7.20, uh, my son comes in the, in the front door, looks over at the couch where I was sitting and says, what are you doing up so early? I says, well, when people text you at 6 or 30 in the morning, it's kind of hard to go back to sleep. And I got a few things I got to do before I go do this, but I really need help finishing up that house that we've, we've been working on together. Uh, we got to finish doing, sand the kitchen cabinets down and put the varnish on them today. If we could do that this afternoon. He says, well, I got a few things I want to do and I got to take some friends home. So I should be back between 2.30 and 3.30. Okay. And it sounded like he would really meant it and everything, and he he wasn't tired or nothing. 
from being out all night, and uh, then he never he never came back, he never came home. Okay, uh, and obviously, with the conversation you guys had, there was his intent to get back to you later that day to help you with that project. Um, so there's this weird thing where some of the news stories are saying that he went camping and we know that he didn't go camping, right? All his camping stuff was left behind at home. Yeah. All his camping stuff left upstairs. His fishing poles were upstairs. Yeah. And that uh, was a little thing I caught in the vanished episode. I think at that point they were thinking that the fishing poles might have still been missing, but you've found the fishing poles since, right? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> one mysteriously turned back up in the back of my pickup truck with a canopy two weeks after he went missing. But oh. the brand new one, but the brand new one that he bought that uh, it, it retracts down to 18 inches. Mm -hmm. He just he just bought that one with a new reel. That one was in his drawer upstairs. OK. Now, the Wednesday before he went missing, him and his uh, him and his grandmother drove out to the coast. He bought a really nice backpack, uh, like a, like a, uh, it's like a camouflage, but it's more like, it's not the dark colors. It's the more the lighter color yeah. of the camouflage. Mm -hmm. And he bought some rope, and he also bought some uh, a bag of rubber bands, and he bought uh, this uh, one sleeping bag, and. Him and his grandmother had a real nice time at the coast and all that. And on on the Friday before he went missing, he was really surprised. We just, got, we just found out about his income tax. And he sat there and said, well, when I get my income tax back, I want to fix up my 92 Ford Ranger 4x4 and put a canopy on it. And I'm, me and grandma, want I want to take her up and down the Oregon and Washington coast and go camp in it, all these campsites, be gone for a couple of weeks to a month and just get that done. When I, when my money comes in, we get the, the truck done. So he had, he had plans. That's why he's getting all this camping stuff. And, uh, he was, he was really shocked that he got so much money back for the part time that he was working. Mm -hmm. But I told him, well, if you claim zero, you get more back at the end of the year. Right. Right. You get, you get less now, but you get more back at the end of the year. He that's what he did. Yeah. Because when he was living with me, I never charged him for rent. Uh, I just told him that he needs to help out with the cell phone bill, and then he wanted internet. So I said, well, you got to help out a little bit on the internet because it was getting really expensive for me. Yeah. And I, I, I I've been injured on the job and been taken off the workforce back in '08. So I haven't worked a real hard physical labor job since 08. Between that and not being able to work that much before, and then I, when I did have work painting houses and changing out windows, my son was there to help me. Right. Now I got, I got no one to help me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when he left that morning, was there any talk of him going fishing at all? No. Okay. All, all he said is, I got to take these people home. And um, what, what were they already there? Why was he saying that he had to take them home? Did they, were they hanging out the night before? No. When, when he came back home that morning, they were outside in the car. Oh. When he came in to get something and he, uh, he dropped the dogs off and he said, he's going to take these people home. But I found out that he took one person home and then came back to the house and the other person w w was still there with him. Okay. And then they went and picked up somebody else. And then that's when they went over, over to Safeway. And he so took the dogs when he came back home, right? He picked the dogs up and they went with him? Yeah. He just left the dogs there for a little bit. Yeah. So they could eat, eat a little bit. And then when he went, when he left again, he always takes the dogs with him. Yeah. I mean – Hardly ever did he ever go anywhere without those dogs. Yeah. The, the, mom, the mama dog with the pet bull, uh, it, it used to belong to his, his girlfriend, Michelle. Mm -hmm. But when they, broke, when they broke up, the dog was more toward him than her. Mm -hmm. So she, she gave the dog to him. And we're talking about and then, Misa and Coda, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah Misa and Coda. 
Yep. And uh, just recently, we had to put Misa down because she she got cancer last year. Oh. We did sur- we had surgery done. She had breast cancer. It cost eighteen hundred dollars for surgery mm-hmm. between between me, my ex, and the grandmother paid for the surgery. And now, just two weeks ago, it came back really bad, and she's in too much pain. Mm. And the vet said, "Well, it's going to cost a little more to do it this time." Then the very next, that same night after we got back from the vet, she was scratching. She ripped it open, mm. and she was in so much pain they took her back to the vet that next morning. I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to her or nothing, and they said they had to put her down. She was wow. in so much pain. Wow. I'm really sorry to hear that, especially after uh, knowing how connected she was to your son and not knowing where your son is and having at least the little bright light of these dogs finding their way back to you. Um, yeah, that's that's a terrible thing to happen. So you were starting to talk about the sighting at Safeway. First of all, when he came back to your house, you were were you gone when he came back to your house and picked up the dogs or were you still there? Oh, uh, what I heard is he came back the second time. I was already gone. I had to okay. go to my other house. Okay. But so we don't have the, we don't have a good time frame of when he came back that second time, or do we know specifically when he was back? Well, I found out because my my uncle Donnie, he he came by around around ten o'clock. Okay. I left at eight fifteen. At ten o'clock, he was talking to to Danny outside. Uh, just picking on him, harassing him, saying, well, I'm a, I'm going to, where's your dad at? Uh, and he says, well, he went to the other house to d- do some work. Uh, cause I had an empty house that someone totally thrashed it. Yeah. And, uh, he sat there and said, well, I don't know if I should go help him or just hang out and, and pester you today. Mm-hmm. He said, well, no, I got things to do and this and that. So you okay. need to go over there. And so that we- was about 10 o'clock. Okay, so we have 10 o'clock, and then the next sighting after that would be the Safeway sighting at 1243? Yeah. Okay, and? And and the only way the detectives found that out is after we got the car back, I, we didn't drive it after we got it back to the the trailer park where my ex and the grandmother lived, Mm -hmm. and I kept on calling the detective every single day saying, you need to come up and search this car, there's too much stuff there's the stuff in the car that don't belong to my son. Yeah. And, and just to let everyone know. So he disappeared with the car and the dogs, but the car was found just what, two days later after he disappeared? Two, day, two days later, 40, 42 miles away. Okay. And the dogs were still missing at that point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really strange. Uh, and what was the name of the area where the car was found? Uh, the, the car was found down, down by Marcola. Okay. And what's weird about it is that he hardly ever drives. He don't drive that way when he goes to Eugene. We always take the freeway. And they they checked all, all the phone pings. He has never been down that road with his cell phone. And even that time, there was no sign of his cell phone being down that way. Okay. His cell phone never left, never left Sweet Home area. Hmm. That's really weird. So you um, do find the car, and they find a Safeway receipt in the car, right? And that's what tips them off to go look for the footage? Yeah, it was me that, that found the receipt. What, they were getting ready to leave. They, they picked up some, uh, some vegetable oil and some, uh, 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 like, I think it was a Monster or a Red Bull. An energy can drink. Okay. That was on the back seat. And then his... Uh, his his EMT food stamp card was on the floorboard of the, of the back seat, and the hard protective case to his his cell phone was on the back uh, on the back floorboard. Okay. And then when the detectives were looking through the, the the car, they told me not don't touch nothing, don't touch nothing. I I just leaned in there and I says, oh, there's some more of those uh, Safeway Monopoly things uh-huh and i he, he said well why would you bring that up i says but every time my son goes to safeway he always brings those to me mm-hmm. and right underneath that oh he the detective came picked it up 
uh, I told him, underneath it, I see a receipt from Safeway. So he pulled the receipt out, and it showed that they bought energy drinks and some donuts and a couple other things, and that's what the date was at Safeway. Did you say vegetable oil? Yeah, it was like an olive oil, a little tiny. Do you know why? Do you know what he needed that for? I don't know. Uh, okay. I know some people were telling him that, like, when you when you go camping or you go out to the coast a lot, it's nice to put olive oil on you. Right. Especially if it's if it's a if it's a cool breeze and you put olive oil on you, the the sun rays keeps you warm with that olive oil. Okay. I've never I've never really tried it. Yeah, no, I, I've heard of, of some things kind of like that. And uh, I know Marissa talked about on the Vanish podcast that, uh, I don't know if earthy is the right word, but he was a little, like he would give the dogs bottled water only. Like he was he was conscious of yeah. food and his intake and kind of using natural ingredients and stuff like that, right? Oh yeah, he, he didn't, he even got mad at me because of me taking my blood pressure medication I've been taking that for the last three and a half, four years yeah. before we went missing. He said, well, Dad, if you eat right, you won't be needing that that medication. Uh, boy, and I wish that was he, true. <laughs> and, and, and if you don't drink the city water and drink this uh, high pH water, mm-hmm. that it, it cleans out your system and just eat eat good foods. Yeah, yeah. And anytime he went out and bought food, he would buy stuff that would really be good for him. Yeah. So it, it might not be as strange, but it's just, it, it kind of struck me because I didn't understand. I, I hadn't heard that before that he had bought oil at that location. So, um, okay. So they look at the footage and he is not alone, right? He's there with one person that goes in with him and someone else that stays out in the car. Yeah. Uh, I guess the name, the kid's name was Caleb. Right. That was walking next to him. Okay. And uh, the other kid was out in the car with, with the dogs. Okay. And his, his, he's Sean, right? So there's Sean and yeah. Caleb that are with him. Uh, yeah. I've been reading some things that mentioned that he walked in with one person, but then came out of the store with two. And I don't know if that's just an article that was kind of written badly. Do you know anything about that? Well, they were a little concerned about a guy walking in front of uh, about – seven or eight steps in front of them. Okay. They thought that he would might have been with him because some law enforcement that identified him said that he's not a very good person. He does all kinds of drugs. Okay. But we checked it out, and this guy does not know Danny at all. Okay. Was Danny known to do drugs or to be in circles of people that were drug users? Uh, he was he was around a couple of them, like like Sean. I think he was into it. Okay. And uh, but uh, like there's a, so many people that are doing hard drugs in Sweet Home. I mm-hmm. mean, he was he was he would smoke his pot every once in a while. Okay. But uh, most of the time, he would have friends come over and he'll go. He'll ask me. He said, "Dad, can I borrow ten dollars? So I go down and get a a twelve pack of beer so we could have beer while playing video games." Okay. Okay. I said, sure. Yeah, that doesn't sound too crazy. Um, and once again, talking, and I know Marissa touched on this as well, but just looking at the type of person he was in terms of putting things into his body, he'd probably be fairly uh, aware and probably not want to put any severely engineered chemicals into his body or stuff like that. And I know a lot of people make a distinction with marijuana where they're like, it's natural, you know, it grows, it's from the earth. So I, I understand that, that that could definitely fit into uh, his type of personality. Um, so on top of the, uh, receipt being found in the car, uh, his keys were also in the car. Yeah. When I, when I found the car, uh, I first passed it up because the way the, the way the forest was cut with the power lines going down Marcola or Brush Creek turns into Marcola. You can't see the car from the highway unless you're going North. I was going South I get all the way down to mile marker five. I get a phone call on my cell phone, and it's uh, the police department want to know if I got to the car yet. I said, I can't find it. It says, well, it's, pat- it's by mile marker 14. 
just passed mile marker 14. I said, well, I'm at mile marker five now. So I turned around and they said, well, we'll, we'll call us when you get back to the car. So I get over there and I walk across this big old field, jump over a fence. There's all kinds of water. I have to walk in a couple of inches of water to get to the car. And when I found the car, there was a lot of water on one on the driver's side and the driver's door was open. Mm-hmm. And I went around the passenger door, opened up that, and it looked like it was just ransacked. There was food thrown everywhere. The glove box was open. And I didn't see no keys or nothing. And I tried calling the officer back, and there was no phone service at the at, right at the car. So I walked down to uh, a hard rock road that the power company put in, and I had phone service, and I called. And he, the, I talked to the officer that was, that came up there, and he said, I said, well, I'm waiting for people to come from Sweet Home, the mother-in-law, my ex-mother-in-law or the grandmother that owns the car, right. to bring me, try to bring me another set of keys for it. And he said, no, there's a set of keys right there next to the armrest wedged in the seat. So I went around to the driver's side, and I found it, and I started the car right up, and only one tire was a little bit in the, in the mud. I just turned the wheel a little bit, rocked the car forward backwards and got it out, got it out of the, the mud. Yeah. Drove it down the little muddy path that I walked up to get down to the gravel instead of going out the muddy road that the car came in on. Right. And when I talked to the detectives, I sat there and said, there ain't no way that my son would leave this car here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been times that I let him borrow my 96 Dodge Caravan. One time they went someplace up in the mountains and they ran into some bad weather and the whole van, all four tires were sunk in mud. But him him and Michelle were able to get the car out. This is when he was dating Michelle. Yeah. And they were able to get the car out without no problem and not, not have to call and bother dad to come to tow them out. Right. Well, and so, even you, when you were there, you still found a place where you could get cell phone signal. And we know that he had a phone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the phone was working. It was, the service was turned on and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So there was no reason why he couldn't have done the same thing if he needed help. But outside of that, sounds like it was pretty easy to get the car out and he probably would have gotten it out. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. You say the driver's door was actually open when you found it. Yeah, I don't know if, if the if the detective didn't the cop didn't didn't close it or okay. Well, okay. when I got there, the door was open. Now I've also seen some reports that seem to suggest his wallet might have been in the car as well. No, his wallet wasn't in the car uh, or his cell phone. Okay, just the just the case to it. Okay, the heart protective case was in inside the car. Okay, and. Uh, but what was also odd is the, the 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 power control knob on the side of the driver's side seat was busted up, and the seat was pushed all the way back. Okay. So I don't see how anybody. You know, I had to figure out what what button to put because the handle was broken off to get the seat forward so I could even reach the pedals. Okay, yeah, that's definitely weird. Um, did it look like there was signs of a struggle in the car? I mean, I know it's ransacked, but did you guys notice anything in terms of, I don't know, some type of blood smears or anything inside of the car? No, okay. nothing inside the car. No, like scuff then, marks from shoes or anything in weird places? No, there was just a lot of, uh, uh, Dorito chips all over the place. The... Some of the paperwork to the car was all over the place. Okay. We never did find the the registration for it hmm. or the proof of insurance for it. Okay. And that, 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 was, that was inside the glove box. Now, I saw a note, and I, once again, I don't know how accurate this is, but uh, about some other items that were found that belonged in the car, but they were found near Foster's Lake. Do you know anything about that? Well, there was some things that I found that uh, he he had a St. Saint, Saint Patrick's hat. Okay. The, one of the big, tall, green St. Patrick's hat. Yeah. And he had, he had a, a really heavy-duty uh, sleeping bag made by Coleman's. 
Okay. I found I found two of the uh, those wool blankets that that they give out to the homeless people and all that. Yeah. I I got some of those when I was working for when I was volunteer through the Lebanon Cleaners. I gave them to my son so he could put them on the back seat. So in case they go swimming someplace, the dog gets wet. Yeah. Throw them on the seat to keep the car nice and clean. Right. There was there was two of those, the sleeping bag, uh, a, a pair of pants, and a shirt, one sock, and that hat was all up on a road just north of the Foster Lake. And how far was that stuff from where the car was? Uh, well, the car was found, uh, I think it's 40, 42 miles from my house, and Foster Lake is six miles the opposite direction. Whoa. That's really strange. Did any of those friends that he was driving around, did they live out in that area? Uh, there was a couple. It's out by river, what they call North River Road. Yeah. There's there's a lot of lot of a lot of friends of, of Sean and Caleb's yeah. that lived out in that area. And uh and but I don't see why Danny would be up way up on that one hill. I mean it was way up on uh, up by Mark's Mark's Ridge. Right. And it's a all wooded area. It's, not very many houses on that road at all. Okay. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, so on top of Danny going missing, uh, it seems that Sean kind of disappeared around this time as well, right? Yeah, because when I, when I got the phone call on the 25th, about 11.05, about, about the car, we went down and got the car. So when I got back, I get on the internet, get on my uh, laptop, and I look up my cell phone bill, and I just couldn't see the current bill. So I call on the phone, and they walk me through it, and I got all the lists of all the current phone calls. Mm -hmm. So then I, I started calling these numbers, and the number that was on Danny's phone that would call a lot, I, I called some lady by the name of... Uh, I can't remember her name right now, but she sits there and she answered the phone and she sits there and said, this is Sean's adopted mother. Okay. And I sit there and said, well, you know where Sean's at? Says he's supposed to be at your house. That's why I got his phone. I says, well, I haven't seen Danny since Sunday. And we just found, I just got a, a phone call from the, the police down in Marcola, that the car was found down there and we can't find the dogs. So can you see if you can locate where Sean's at? Maybe Sean knows what happened. And so she said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll text you if I find him and this and that. She started sending me text messages saying that she can't, she can't find him and nobody knows where he's at. And then finally on the, the 28th, she got back to me and said that, yeah, we did find him and he's home safe. So where he was from the 23rd until the night of the 27th, when she found out he was home by the 28th, uh, we don't know. It's just unexplained. Uh, what about Caleb? Do we know where Caleb was during this stretch? Uh, the detective didn't tell me too much about that. They said that he was taken home after they went to Safeway hmm. on that Sunday. Okay. <coughs> huh. Um, so tell us about uh, Coda and Misa. How how were they found? What what happened around that? Well, with, we we I I kept on seeing muddy footprints a couple of days after we got the car. So every time I would I would take the special grain-free dog food that my son bought for his dogs. I would take that out there and sometimes I put it up higher so the little varmints can't get it. Yeah. And I would see new fresh, fresh tracks and all that. 
And so every other day I would, had, would double check that food and the food would be gone. Mm-hmm. So I'm going down there all the time checking the food and keep putting more food there. And on that's when the detectives started doing more search. Well, on the on the eleventh day, they asked a local resident that lives just a mile down from where the car was found, asked if we could search the back side of your property. We're looking for this young gentleman with his two dogs. They had a picture of Misa. We didn't have no picture of Coda. Mm-hmm. So the, the the guy at the residence sits there and says, well, this dog and the puppy that came down on my property. And we were able to catch the puppy. We've had the puppy here for a day and a half. But the mother dog kept on barking at us and tried to attack us and then ran off in the woods because we wouldn't let, we wouldn't let the other dog go. Yeah. And uh, that's when uh, when the detective was in Albany, and he instead of calling me, he came by my house. He sat there and said, "Well, they found they found the dog. Uh, search and rescue down there right now with him." And I said, "Well, I want to go get him." He says, "Well, you come down tomorrow and pick him up." I said, "No, I'm going to go right now. I want my I want the dog back." Yeah. So I I, I, I got in my truck and went down there and. I mean, as soon as that as soon as that puppy see me, that that guy could not hold on that leash hard enough, almost pulled him to his knees yeah. when that dog came toward me. Well, th- I've I, I've always called the dog Dakota mm-hmm. and instead of Coda, and so I he, he, I guess he likes Dakota better <laughs> now because I've had him for all this time, but. Yeah, and then we kept on going back down there searching. I mean, we even took the the puppy with us, and me and Michelle went down there a lot with the puppy, and the the dog would run us into all these all these blackberries and everything, and uh, we were trying to figure out if if, if it's uh, tracks where Danny would be at. Yeah, but we're finding we're finding more signs of rabbits and deer than than, than any human tracks. Right. So, and I mean, for the first couple of days, I had to really nurse, nurse Coda back because he was just ribs, ribs and bones when I got him back. Yeah. And now you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how, how much bigger he is and how much healthier and all that is. Yeah. Sometimes I, I, he's, he's worse than a five-year-old, leaving a five-year-old at home, uh, (laughs) unattended. (laughs) He likes to get into things. Yeah. So how many then, days after did, did Misa get found? Well, on, on Mother's Day morning, I went back down in that area, went searching that whole area. Then I went up toward up toward Shotgun Creek. That's just north of the mile marker 13. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started putting all kinds of posters out. And then I started headed home, putting more posters up on the highway. As soon as I get up to highway... 228 and Brush Creek, uh, I get a phone call from Michelle. I, I thought that was odd. I pulled over and answered it, and she said, well, Chelsea, my other adopted daughter, sat there and said that she was on her way down to Cottage Grove, and she takes a shortcut from Sweet Home down through S- Springfield over to the freeway. Yeah. Instead of going all the way out to the Interstate 5. And she says, as she was passing mile marker 12, she seen Misa running down the side of the highway. Whoa. And it ran up, ran back up in the woods as soon as she pulled over. And so then she called the animal rescue people. They, uh, they rushed out real quick. And they went up in the hills and chased her back down. And then, uh, and then Chelsea was calling Misa's name. And Misa ran right up to her. Hmm. And. She had her in the van when I, by the time I got back down there. Yeah. That's when Michelle called me and said, well, uh, Chelsea had been trying to call you, but you didn't answer your phone. So she called me. And that's when Michelle called me and told me about it. Yeah. I was really, I was tickled pink that we, we found, we found her. Yeah, absolutely. Me, me and, and, uh, me and the search, search party, 
the main person of the search party down there in S S Springfield, uh, we put a homing device on Misa just in case she got loose from my lease. And me and him and, and Cody and Misa walked around that hill for a long time, almost three hours, up and down all these hills. And we never did find any, any signs, any tracks, anything that, that, that could belong to Danny or yeah. any. And then he, then he was called off because some uh, elderly guy was took off to go to a doctor's appointment, never made it. So we had to quit that search and go back down to Eugene area. Yeah, that is one of the big questions, I think, in this whole case is, um, is Danny around where the car was found or was the car taken there and left there after he was taken somewhere else? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think the car was, was uh, I think that, I think the intention was to drop, the, get rid of the dogs. But the only person out of all his friends that was around the house a lot and I used to go upstairs and, and see what they're doing. The only person ever talked about Marcola was Sean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said he knew people that lived down that area that uh, grow marijuana. Okay. Um, has Sean been interviewed by the police about this? Yeah, I, I wasn't present, but uh, they said they interviewed him a little bit here and there. Okay. But. And then there was a rumor that he's been cleared 100% where he has not. No one's been cleared. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's there's some things that has happened that I have not put out on Facebook. And the detectives are working on it now. We found out a lot more recent information within the last two weeks uh, different phone numbers and different uh, different contacts, and they're probably looking into that. Uh, I hope they find something out about it. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we don't want to jeopardize the investigation. So uh, I will trust your judgment in terms of sharing just what you want about any of that type of stuff. So, so from the reports I saw, it looks like law enforcement did do a lot of searches and we have a unique problem here because he actually lives danny lives in lynn county but the car is found in lane county right yes so we've got a bit of a jurisdictional issue going on there but from what i can see there was several searches that were done kind of leading up to the end of last year and I haven't really seen anything in terms of this year has there been more official searches by law enforcement done this year uh, the only thing that John Levick of the Lynn County Sheriff's Detective, uh -huh. uh, that's, that's John Levick too, the, the, his son, uh, he has told me that there's been a couple of people who have called in tips about, uh, somebody bearing something up in the woods up toward Cascadia. Okay. And that him and a lady that he knows with a cadaver dog has gone up there two or three times. And all they found was someone's garbage that they burnt in a mm. burn barrel and didn't want to take it to the dump. They just dug a hole out in the, in the forest and buried it. Right. So, but they had to check on those tips. Okay. Uh, but outside of that, no major scale searches no other types of like you know helicopter drone anything well, like that not through law enforcement but we uh with the with the shelf with the help of S S stephanie that is going to going to school here at college to be a private private investigator mm -hmm. she got a hold of some guy with a drone and when we're getting weird tips that he might be up by Green Peter, up by Foster Lake, and up by Yellow Bottom, that we went in those different areas with this guy with a drone, and he was able to fly the drone around over the other side of the lake, the, the river, that it says private property, we can't get in, the gates are all locked, mm 
mm-hmm. and he would fly over about a mile and a half, two miles over. Yeah. Just like he also went down to Shotgun Creek with us because that's where the, one day the dog was found. Misa was seen at Shotgun Creek. And then five hours later, was seen at the in front of the grocery store down there in Marcola. Oh, wow! So, and that, and that's a big different. That's, that's almost three and a half miles away. Right. And there was one one incident that a kid said that this white dog came up to him, and as soon as he turned around and said something, the dog ran off. I think Misa thought that was Danny. And when he turned around and saw saw him and heard the voice, that he just ran off. It wasn't him. Okay. Like Misa's looking for her, her master. Yeah, yeah. And we even we even asked the authorities if, if we could take the car back out that way and be able to camp out uh, over in that area, but mm-hmm. they they said that we don't really recommend you to do that. Okay. Um, so I heard on the Vanish podcast that uh, initially, when it comes to information about his cell phone, that it shut off on the day he went missing, but then it kicked back on the next day, and the pings said that it was in your in your hometown when it when it kicked back on. Well, according to the the map I got from the detective, the the phone was always been on up until the last ping on the the Verizon Tower up by Marks Ridge and Pleasant Valley. That's only two miles from my house. Yeah. It so the phone has been on the whole time up until three eighteen on Monday. Okay. And a lot of the pings were between Highway two two eight and Highway twenty. Uh in a wooded area and I've, I've gotten some tips from uh, some psychic mediums mm-hmm. about searching that area, but the detectives don't want to search it. I don't know why I contacted the owner of the property that's on the tax records and he, I told him the situation. And he says, well, you know, about the same time that your son went missing, there was a whole bunch of people partying in my, around my property up there, up by a rock quarry. Yeah. And that I called law enforcement. I had four or five of them trespassed and a couple of people arrested for breaking into my house and messing with my uh, vehicles. Since then, he's put up big gates and padlocks. So people can't get in there. And he even said that his name is Bob. He even sat there and said, well, you have John call me and make up a time that he wants to come out. He could bring cadaver dogs. Uh, He's law enforcement. He could search whatever he wants. I have no problem with him coming up there and search. But he, he still will not even make the attempt to even go up there because we got the tip from two different psychic mediums mm. uh, de- de- describing every, everything that they seen that what that happened to my son. And but I the can't pings, say that. The pings also point there, right? Yeah, according to the map that I, I checked after the, after the, the psychics got a hold of me, uh, some of the pings were up there up until... Uh, zero eighteen on the on the twenty fourth. Hmm. So that's eighteen minutes after midnight. Yeah. On on, on the twenty fourth. Yeah. And the pings are all up in that area. There's like nine or ten pings within that one and a half mile radius. Okay. But they won't search it. Um, has it been tough trying to? to deal with this investigation? Do you feel like they're doing everything that they could be? Or is this just another one of those stop gaps and a long list of stop gaps with how this is, how this is going for you? Well, at, at first, Chad Rogers, the main de- detective, he was having a hard time 
tracking down and talking to people because the law enforcement in Sweet Home would not give him any information where these people reside at. Whoa. Wow. The local authorities says, it's not our case. We don't want to get involved. These people are homeless. We don't know where they're at. And I told Chad, I says, no, these officers know everything that's going on in this town. They make it known if there's somebody new in town, they want to know who it is. Right. And I, I, I had me and me and Michelle and, we found out where uh, Caleb lived, so the detective could go talk to him. We also uh, tracked down his his older brother. Mm-hmm. His older brother. We talked to him at, at a park, and, did, and and Chad drove up in the rain and talked to him. And he said, "Well, I'm still trying to find your brother." He said, "Well, my mom's hiding him out at, at the house," mm-hmm. and took him right, right over to him and started talking to him. Wow. And then I, the, Chad was kind of iffy about, well, why, why is this law enforcement doing this? Why ain't, why don't they want to help? And when I told him the different situations about the pocket bike and right. uh, just driving down the road and they would pull him over for want to see who he has in his car and this and that. I mean, that's insane. And the types of charges you're talking about, I mean, it's, I can't believe that they were that focused on him. I mean, having, you know, a motorized board and having a pocket bike. And I just, I, I get that, you know, yeah, you're not supposed to be using that stuff on public roads. And I get that there's charges, they, but wow, it's just, it sounds like there's so much more going on to that story. I just, I don't know why they, they pinpointed their focus on him like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't see why he went. He went to jail so many times for uh, the charge of the misdemeanor. Yeah. I mean, just like like getting a jaywalking ticket. Right. And right. then uh, you don't pay your fifty dollar fine one month. And uh, t- t- one time he he sentenced him uh, seven days in jail. And since the jail was full. They kicked him out after two days, mm-hmm. and and Lynn County Sheriff said we could do that, but you still got to let the, the judge know. I went to court with him the, after he got out of jail, and the judge sat there and says, "No, I said seven days, and I mean seven days, so I'm going to add five hundred dollars to your fine because you didn't serve your sentence." Well, I had no choice; they kicked me out. Yeah. So, well, that attitude, you're going to go back to jail. So. Regardless of what the reason is, definitely a tough relationship between your son and the local authorities. And it seems like that relationship is kind of affecting this investigation a bit, because when this other county is calling them, asking for information, they're just kind of putting their hands up. Oh, we can't help you. We don't know where these people are. Um, I did I did see on the Oregon State Police's Facebook page that they made a post about Danny's case as well. Are they officially involved in the case in any way? Not that I know of. I know a lot of people on Facebook that is seeing that the detectives ain't doing a whole lot. They've been forwarding information to the Oregon State Police to inform them that they need to search these areas because the other detectives ain't doing nothing. Yeah. But as far as I know, I've never talked to an Oregon State Police officer about the missing my son being missing. You know, you might want to see if they have a missing persons department specifically and just reach out to them. I mean, with what you're dealing with here already, it's a challenge just because of the jurisdiction difference. I mean, I would think that at some level, the state police could at least say, hey, do you guys want some help coordinating this? Is there something that we can do to, you know, help help get this case rolling forward? Uh, couldn't hurt, right? Just trying to reach out to them and trying to bump it up a level. Yeah, and I I gone to the state police one time, and they they said that it's not our our case, and that if the detectives ain't doing their jobs, here's the numbers to their supervisors. Mm. You can call them or call the FBI. So I called the I, I've already called the FBI three times, and yeah. they said, well, unless we get notification from the first detective that's opened up the case that wants our help, we're not going to step in. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a real tough thing with some of these cases. Uh, basically, the FBI doesn't have jurisdiction. They really need the local authorities to ask for their help. And even when they do that, it's they work in kind of an uh, assistance capacity. It's not like they take over the investigation and you know give everything a fresh look from the start. So. Wow, really, really tough. Um, so Chad Rogers is still the lead detective on this. Yeah. Okay. And there's there's times I call him, leave a message, and uh, every two days I call him and call him and call him. Sometimes I get a phone call back within two weeks. Sometimes it's, I haven't talked to him now in over a month and a half. Yeah. Uh, I've been leaving messages for him to call me, but I don't get no calls back. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to have contact information in the description box below. As you guys can hear, this case needs help. It needs other people to send some information in to help move this thing forward. There's someone out there that has heard someone talking about this case or overheard some things. You might have the missing piece to this whole puzzle. So in the description box below, I will have uh, Chad Rogers' direct line, but I'm also going to put the general line for the Lane County Sheriff's Office. Uh, if you do call them, please reference case number 17-2729. Uh, on top of that, I did take a look for Facebook pages um, for this case in particular. Uh, it looks like one of them was started, but then isn't really being kept up to date. And there's another one uh, that is being pretty well kept up to date, right? The uh, I think it's Hope and Justice for Danny. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. The Hope and Justice for Danny is the one that was put, put out there from... Stephanie, okay. the one that is going to school to be a private eye. Okay. Uh, she opened up that one. The first first one was opened up because of my my daughter got a hold of a friend of hers in Sweet Home and opened up that first one. But there was so much rumors and gossip going on that it was just getting really hectic. And so we had to open up another page and let people know exactly what's going on instead of listening to all these rumors and gossip yeah. that people just want to put their nose in something they don't know nothing about. Yeah. 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 That's, that's really a tough aspect to this whole case is, uh, and I know Marissa touched on this on the Vanish podcast as well. There is just a huge rumor mill going on with this case. And uh, part of that could be people trying to control the story a little bit. Part of that is just, yeah, exactly like you said, people that don't know enough about the story and just kind of winging it off the, the top of their head. Um, is there? I saw that there was a fundraiser going at one point, but it looks like it's closed. Are there any current fundraisers or current ways to help your search? No. We've been, we've been trying to get some more fundraisers going. Uh, we even tried to get a, a thing for a reward mm -hmm. for any information leading to uh, the whereabouts and the and the, the convention of who was involved. Yeah. And this and that. But it seems like, I don't know, if not to get enough uh, notification, people not knowing about it or something. And those cases... The fundraiser, you can only open up so long. If nobody makes any donations within a certain period of time, then they automatically close. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, well, if that changes, if you guys do kick up another one, please be sure to reach out to me, and I'll be sure to let uh, my subscribers know about it as well. And, uh, of course, I would like to personally donate to that as well. So uh, when you get that, when another one comes up and you get it rolling, please, please be sure to let me know about that, Ken. Now, there's a lot of people that keep asking me if I ever go out and search and all that. I says, yeah, I go out every every once in a while. For the last month, well, last last two months, I haven't really been able to. I've been hurting a lot more. Yeah. And uh, last month, I, me and my ex-mother-in-law, we had to get out of town. There was so much rumors going on. I needed a break. I didn't post nothing on Facebook because of the stuff that was going on. Suspicious activities around my house when I was there. I didn't want anybody on Facebook to know I wasn't home. Mm -hmm. and have my 85 year old grandmother watching over the dogs for me. Yeah, she did. A, she did an excellent job for her age. But yeah. uh, I had to get away. I had to talk to more of my family. I went back and surprised my sister, my nieces, two nieces and a nephew that I haven't seen in 23 years. 
since my dad passed away and went back to Moline, Illinois and saw them. It, it helped me out a lot. But then as soon as I got home, it seemed like the, the hurt just hurt worse now because I, I want to get out there and do more searching. But my vehicles are breaking down. Yeah. Uh, some stuff I could do myself. Other stuff I, I need help on. And it's just it's so hard. But I, every time anybody wants to go out and go searching and all this, and they want to take their vehicle and take drive by me, I offer to give them gas money, I offer to buy them something to drink, lunch, whatever, yeah. and everything. I don't want it to be like somebody doing this just just for free. They're helping me out. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, if there are searches coming up, can people see about those at the Hope and Justice Facebook page? Is that are they announced there in yeah. some way? Okay. Yeah, that's where they'd be announced at. Okay, excellent. Anything you want to say to the audience before we go? Uh, well, I just know that there's at least nine or ten people that I've been hearing that knows what happened to my son, and it just seems like I don't know if they're afraid of somebody that's going to hurt them if they bring something up, but the law enforcement, they're there to help. You could be anonymous and you can call in and give tips and not give your name or nothing. And it's that they look into it. If this really sounds good that, uh, and let, let, let them do the, the main work and everything. You don't have to just drag the person in, but call in and leave some tips about this and that and things that you hear about. Yeah. Because most most of the tips that you hear about that are silent and bars and stuff like this, they're, they're probably more, more true than just the gossip that's going around on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Someone out there has the right piece of info and they might not even know it. So if you have any info on this case, please call it in. Uh, is there a different phone number for the anonymous tips or are you talking about if they call the uh, county sheriffs that they can call in the tips anonymously? Well, on on the web on the the site, there's a missing person uh, tip line. Okay. That they, that they call into. Okay, so we'll have that number in the description box below, so you guys can use that specifically for anonymous tips. All right, Ken, uh, thank you so much for your time here tonight, and um, I, I just I want to tell you, be sure to find. Uh, some way of taking care of yourself in all this. I can see that you're exhausted by this. Uh, it was nice to hear that you at least got some personal time and went and rallied around your family a little bit. Remember how you might need that from time to time just to keep yourself moving on all, on all this. Um, and just know that there's many, many people out here that care. We want, we want a conclusion to this for you and your family. Uh, and so that if you do need to have a memorial, you have a memorial. Uh, if there's some other outcome, whatever it is, we want you guys to have those answers because I know how hard it is just having these questions that you're faced with for so long now. So I'm really sorry that you're, you're dealing with this. Mm, thank you. Once again, thanks to Ken Oberg for spending some time with us on today's case. Uh, and I just want to ask if you have some information, please use that contact info in the description box below. Please get that information into the hands of people that can act on it. Let's do something to try to help this family figure out where Danny is. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new Brain Scratch. <laughs>